As, uh, as many of you know, Matt and Melissa King's uh, baby, baby Esri, Esri Abigail King, uh, was delivered on Saturday uh, a week ago and passed away on Tuesday of this week. So uh, obviously your prayers and your thoughts and your concerns, uh, Matt and Melissa and Sandy and Gary and the whole family have felt all of these and are beyond grateful and thankful. Want to let you know that uh, they are going to have a private family service on Saturday, so be in prayer for them during that. But also Matt and Melissa have said that if you feel moved to want to do something and want to help, what they uh, ask is that you would make a donation to Children's Hospital in DC. That the experience that they had there and the care that they received there was uh, beyond what they could have hoped or imagined in the midst of an unimaginable situation. And what Matt said to me is the thought and the idea that other people being able to benefit if they are in the same position gives them hope and comfort. So if you would make a donation in Esri's name, that would be something that they would, um, they would appreciate and they would love. So it's, it's never really happened to me. I mean, I don't know if it has happened to you all, uh, but uh, the story that was uh, pretty spread the last couple of weeks on the internet, uh, it happened to this guy named Anthony. Anthony was in an elevator, just minding his own business, and the elevator opened up and a celebrity walked in. And he said, okay, I'm going to play it cool. Just, I, and he, he said, I just nodded. Hey, I'm playing it cool. Everything's fine. But he said the more, the, as the elevator went to the destination, the more and more he got excited. The more and more he felt like he needed to say something. This might be his only chance to say something. So as the doors open, he is having this inner, inner struggle. And as he gets off the elevator, he stops and he pauses and he says uh, to the celebrity, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers, I, I just want you to know how thankful I am for you. Because see, Anthony tells a story um, about Mr. Rogers. Now, if you, if you don't know who Mr. Rogers is, um, somebody might not. Somebody, somebody might not. We're, we, we don't make people feel bad. So, um, Mr. Rogers is like God's gift to all of us that we can all enjoy over and over again. He had a children's program uh, that has uh, now, uh, you know, it, it went until 2001. And then recently, uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood which should be required viewing not just for children but for adults. When you, when you get real mad and you want to roar, take a deep breath and count to four, right? Like this is, is this not good advice for all of us? Uh, so anyway, Mr. Rogers, uh, he, you know, Mr. Rogers had this, this amazing and calm and thoughtful children's show and even now, in the midst of noise and uh, explosions and as much, you know, just information as you could share, the Daniel Tiger's neighborhood is this quiet, thoughtful, intelligent opportunity for kids to think about their feelings and think about how they are encountering and interacting with the world around them. And it is still a blessing. So anyway, Anthony, gets off and, and Mr. Rogers is getting off too. And, and so Anthony says, I just, I want to share with you how much you have meant to me. And, and Mr. Rogers says, were you one of my neighbors? <laughs> and Anthony says, yes, sir, I was. And so, and Mr. Rogers says, well, give me a hug then. And so Anthony, who's in his mid twenties at this point, hugs Mr. Rogers. And then Anthony gets a little emotional because a few months earlier, uh, Anthony had lost his grandfather. And as he was walking through, he said, honestly, I had not thought about Mr. Rogers neighborhood since I was little. And as he was walking through this public space, Mr. Rogers neighborhood was on. And he was transfixed by it. This old episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was on, and he was transfixed by it. And he said, it was like I was back there. It was like I was back there as a little kid. And Mr. Rogers, right there, right then in that episode, was saying, 
Gosh, it's really hard when we get mad, isn't it? What do you do with all the mad you feel? And Anthony was saying, I got a lot of mad right now. I got a lot of mad, and I don't know what to do with it. And so Anthony said, I, I felt like a crazy person, but I started telling Mr. Rogers how much not only growing up, but how much of the last couple of months his show has meant to him. Mr. Rogers looked at him and said, will you come sit down over here with me? I'd like to hear about what's going on. Anthony said, I knew I should say no, but it's Mr. Rogers. And so, of course, I was not going to say no. And he went and he sat down and he talked about his grandfather passing away. Mr. Rogers said, How, when, when did that happen? And he said, it was about three months ago. And Mr. Rogers said, my grandfather passed away many, many years ago. But he built a boat, and he let me have the boat as, as a reward for working hard. And, and Mr. Rogers said, I, I really regret that I don't still have that boat. But what I do have is his love and his example and all the things that he taught me. And you have that from your granddad, too. And that's never going to go away. And Anthony said, if, and even though I was already crying, I somehow found new levels of crying to cry. And I hugged Mr. Rogers again. And he, and he said to Mr. Rogers, I'm so sorry. I'm sure I've made you late for wherever you need to be and whatever you need to do. And Mr. Rogers looked at him and said, sometimes we are right where we need to be, right when we need to be. And so he, he ends it by saying, Oftentimes when we hear quotes uh, from celebrities or quotes from people, there's always somebody, certainly on the internet, to go, well, actually, here's what they're really like. And he, Anthony said, I'm here to say, Mr. Rogers is and was the real deal. And what made it special from this story is, is obviously not just the words that he said, right? Right? Because those words could have been said by anybody in any sort of setting. But what made it special and what made his show special is his presence. And what I mean by that is his awareness in the exact moment of right now and right here, we are in this place and you are here in front of me. And what I am saying is not just my generic advice that I pull up whenever I've got to say something to somebody. And what I'm saying isn't just normal, just words we say to fill the air. I am here and I am present with you. And when I am present with you, I can speak to what I see in you, and you can speak to what you see in me. What made this special was Mr. Rogers' presence. And that is what we are talking about today. When we talk about Pentecost, we aren't just talking about the birthday of the church. We aren't just talking about this one unique scene. Uh, we, we read, uh, you know, sort of a dramatic version of it, but I would, I would like for you to open your Bible with me if you have it. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can look under your seat. There's, uh, there's one there. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, as we start to understand what happened then on that day of Pentecost, we can maybe get some clues about how it is still affecting, shaping, and speaking to us even today. So it is Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now, Pentecost was already a Jewish festival. It was already um, understood as, as one of the festivals that uh, faithful Jews, that's why uh, in the story, there's already going to be a ton of people there. It's not like they all knew something was happening, so they showed up, right? So, when the day of Pentecost came, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let's just pause for a moment and think about how ridiculously peculiar this is. Okay? If right now each one of you stood up and started speaking a language you don't normally speak, I don't think we'd go, hey, this is swell. <laughs> right? 
So we need to understand this is more than just, gosh golly, what a neat time. What, you know, God's just swell. What we need to understand is there is power and there is movement and there is something different, scary, almost dangerous about what is going on here. Suddenly you are standing up and you are speaking a language you don't know by a power compelled inside of you that you can't control, right? Now there were, were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they ask, are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own language? And then all of those different names that we're not going to go through. Verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? And then there's always somebody, right? Humans are humans, whether it's 2,000 years ago or now. There's always somebody. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine, listen to them go. 14, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. And then he goes on to quote Joel. He goes on to quote others. He goes on to explain that God is working and doing something different and new in, in some ways, God is doing something unique and different and new. But in other ways, God is echoing and fulfilling what God has always done. Here's what I mean by that. If we start over here at the beginning, when we open up the story of, the story of God and the story of people that we see in Scripture, we see the garden. We see Adam and Eve and God. And what God chooses to do in the garden, what God chooses to do is to walk and dwell and be present with people. Right? But then sin, that stuff that we do or leave undone that breaks our relationship with God, that turns our attention away from God and back towards us, that separates the relationship. And so there is this constant movement of God to bring people back in, this constant wooing from God saying, you are out there and I want you here, present with me. You see God make these agreements, these covenants, these bound statements, saying, you who are out there, I want you back in here with me. He calls Abram and says, go to this place you don't know. Even though you are old, I am going to make you the father of many nations. You will be with me. And Abram follows and goes, becomes Abraham. We see time after time, we, as they form a nation, a nation of people who follow and worship God, they don't have a king because God says, I will be your king. You don't need to be like your neighbors. Let me be present with you and among you. And time and again, sin turns people away over and over until prophets rise up, powered by God to say, there will be one who will come because God's desire for you and God's desire to be in communication and connection with you is so great. There will be one who will come who will be with you and among you. You can call him God with us. So we understand this prophecy that the Messiah is coming who will be Emmanuel. God with us. And as we look back, we see it as Jesus. Jesus who walks and lives and works. And as everybody is still sort of waiting for Jesus to do things that in their sort of temporal world, Jesus says, no, I'm doing something bigger, something more. I'm creating a pathway so that everyone everywhere can be reconnected to God forever. But that's going to require that I die. I'm going to have to separate and then when I come back, I will go up to my Father and something different will come. Something that will be a comfort, a guide, a teacher, an aid. Something that you can't imagine. But, but something amazing will come. And everyone says, no, 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 don't leave us. Don't take away your presence. And yet over and over, the pattern we see of God is God bringing the promise and then fulfilling it with God's presence. Bringing the promise that I will be with you. Bringing the promise of Emmanuel, God with us, and fulfilling it 
with Jesus' presence and then fulfilling it even more. So as you see the presence and the over and over, as you see this opportunity, when Jesus promises there is going to be one coming who will be in you, who will be the comforter, who will be the guide, who will help you, over and over and over we see God make promises and over and over and over we see the fulfillment, but a fulfillment in his presence. So, when Pentecost comes, what we see is the latest example of the Holy Spirit coming and being poured out on all of these people who believe. Of the Holy Spirit showing up, and now what Emmanuel means is not just God with us in like, we all are together, and I am with you right now, but in two hours we're going to separate. But God with us in that everyone who believes the Holy Spirit comes and, and is inside of us, dwelling in and around and among us, so that when, wherever we go and whatever we face and whatever we do, God is there with us, truly and completely and totally Emmanuel. This is the promise that is fulfilled in Pentecost. When we think about the Holy Spirit, it is the understanding and the truth that this powerful force, this force that is beyond our control, fire is the perfect example of this, right? Because we use fire to make s'mores, right? You didn't see that coming. But we also, we also use fire, not use, we also know fire burns houses down, right? So, fire, the Holy Spirit is not some cute little poodle who sits beside us whispering that God loves us. The Holy Spirit is a force inside us, transforming and shaping whatever we will give up so that God can be with us and among us even more, so that God's presence can be more fully in us and transform not just us, but all around us as well. This is the promise of God that I will send one to you who will comfort you and guide you. You will never be alone. And we see that promise fulfilled in God's presence. So, this matters because there are times where we don't feel God's presence. There are times where it feels absent and silent and no one's home and we rightly cry and curse and scream and throw things and go, God, where are you? And when you do that, you are joining in thousands of years of faithful people who do that too. When you pick up the Bible and you look at the book of Psalms, which was the prayer book and hymn book of ancient Israel, over half of them are laments. These people knew how to complain. Right? They put us to shame. The example we give all the time is there is, a, there is a hymn in there, a prayer in there of God. Would you please bash the children's heads of my enemy's children's heads against the rocks in your name? Right? That's not something we sing very often. <laughs> but that's honest. That is lament. That is where they are, and they say, God, where are you? And in those moments, we cry, and we complain, and we do it as full-throated as we know, but we also do something else. We also hold on knowing that we have this promise. When you can't feel the presence, you still hold to the promise. When you can't feel the presence, you know that God, throughout eons of history, has never let down his creation. And you hold to the promise when you can't feel the presence. Because Pentecost is the Holy Spirit coming upon us, but we also celebrate it as the birthday of the church because none of us are smart enough to do it on our own. None of us are good enough to do it on our own. Each of us needs each other of us because we can't just be our own person. We can't see and understand and experience God's presence as well by ourselves as we can all together in community. Because that's what God has invited us into is presence. That is how we are called to live is to be present. Mr. Rogers didn't just show up with some sort of special supernatural ability 
to be present to people. He was formed and shaped by the same gospel and the same God who lives inside of you. So as we hold up Mr. Rogers, we don't do this and go, man, why aren't there more people like that? We hold up Mr. Rogers and we say, this is what happens. This is one reflection of what you do when you let God's presence inside of you and transform the inside of you. You then become present to other people. You then become the kind of person who listens, who loves. You don't have to have super amazing advice. You have to be present. Because when people are seen and heard, they are loved in a true way. When you can't feel God's presence, you lean on the promise. And when you are filled with God's presence, overflowing, you have the opportunity then to be present to other people. This is what Pentecost is. This is why we keep coming back to church is because we don't ever have it completely figured out. Certainly not on our own. And when we get back together, we celebrate our good times together with cake. And when we fall and struggle and cry and weep, we don't dare do that alone. Because there, there are scores upon scores of people who are holding and praying and lifting us up together. When you can't feel the presence, you rely on the promise. And when you are so filled with the presence you don't know what to do, you have the opportunity to then go be God's presence to other people. That is why we celebrate Pentecost. Because it is a miracle for us and through us. Not just on a day a long time ago, but today and every single day of our lives. Come, Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? God, we bring our honesty to you. We bring our doubt and our questions and our struggles and our hurts and our wounds and our grief and our joys and our celebrations and we lay it all before you. We pray, God, that you will fill us with your spirit, that you will shape us and teach us and guide us, that even when we don't sense your presence, we will trust in your promise and believe. And God, we pray when we are so filled with your presence, we don't even know how to handle it, that we will be present to others, that we will share your love and your goodness, that we will share a kind word and a prayer, that we will be who you are calling us to be. We give thanks, God, for the Holy Spirit that guides and shapes and teaches. We give thanks, God, that we gather together in this place, this beautiful, imperfect place, to worship you. Thank you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.